Good morning, and welcome to the Church of the River here in beautiful downtown Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Reverend Sam Title, and I have the joy of serving this congregation as minister. If you would like to learn more about our congregation or get more involved, uh, the best thing to do is stick around at the end of our worship service today and you will see announcements going by on your screen that can tell you what's going on in the life of our congregation and also uh, how to get on our mailing list and how to, how to get more involved. Um, you can also send an email to info at churchoftheriver.org and uh, we'll get you set up. And as always, if you want to stay up to the minute on what is going on in the life of our congregation, uh, the best way to find us is to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. With no further announcements, our worship service will now begin. We gather together to worship on this spring morning with joy in our hearts and wonder on our lips. Come, let us worship together. We have a very, very special guest this week. Um, uh, she is going to be joining us this week and next week um, uh, as part of a, a collaboration that that she and I are doing. Our, our guest is uh, Sue Buzzard, who is a, a violinist and an educator and uh, a, an incredibly talented person. She is a graduate of uh, Berklee School of Music and has performed uh, all over the country doing really incredible work. It is such an amazing thing to get to have her uh, with us this week and next week. So please uh, get ready for uh, some music from Sue Buzzard. Hello, Church of the River friends. When Minister Title told me about this week's theme, he showed me the book Gathering Moss by Robin Wall Kimmerer. The author writes about using a magnifying glass to see huge details in tiny, tiny patches of moss. So I wrote a song using some recorded close-up sound effects on my five string, like we were listening with a magnifying glass for our ears. I took a walk outside for some inspiration and found some moss I wanted to share with you all in this video. When the video started, starts listen for the sounds of the whistling wind, some creaky tree branches, and the fuzzy feeling of moss when you rub it with your fingers. Mmm, fuzzy. Enjoy!
Hi everyone. Today is Mother's Day and during this time of year there's a poem that I love to read written by a poet named Julia Kasdorf and it's called What I Learned From My Mother. The grown-ups can look it up but I wanted to share a few lines with you this morning just to kind of get us going. She writes, I learned from my mother how to love the living to have plenty of vases on hand in case you have to rush to the hospital with peonies cut from the lawn, black ants still stuck to the buds. I learned that whatever we say means nothing. What anyone will remember is that we came. To every house you enter, you must offer healing, a chocolate cake you made yourself, the blessing of your voice, your chaste touch. This poem always makes me think about what I learned from my own mother. I know Reverend Sam is going to be talking to the grown-ups later about moss and the ways we find something special in the things right under our feet. I learned from my mother to go out walking like she did, every day if you can, and while you're out there, to pay attention. I learned to collect little treasures that caught my eye, to lay them out like an offering. Leaves, little flowers, smooth rocks, and worn wood. Nothing is too small to be special. I learned to appreciate beauty. I learned to be quick to make up after an argument, and I learned that the direct path isn't the only one. I learned that the shelves in your refrigerator come apart and that they can and should be cleaned. And finally, I learned how to be authentically myself. The last thing I wanted to share with you about Mother's Day that it's taken me a little longer to learn is that there are many different ways to be a mother and not all of them are easy or expected. Anyone who takes care of other people who shows love does the work of mothering. It takes a lot of people to raise families and we need all different kinds of mothers out there. One person can't do it all. And in fact, in other cultures and places around the world, there were what was called other mothers, other people that children had close relationships with that were kind of like mothers too. So I'll leave you this morning wondering what you learned from your mothers and your other mothers and in gratitude for everyone who does the work of caring. You're beloved, you're powerful, you're important. Go in peace. Our first reading this morning comes from Genesis, chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Here ends the reading.
Our second reading comes to us from Gathering Moss by Robin Wall Kimmerer. My former husband used to teasingly deride my passion for mosses, saying that mosses were just decoration. To him, mosses were merely the wallpaper of the forest providing ambiance for his photographs of trees. A carpet of mosses does, in fact, provide this lustrous green light. But focus the lens on the mossy wallpaper itself, and the green blur of the background resolves into a sharp focus, and an entirely new dimension appears. The wallpaper, which seemed at first glance to be of a uniform weave, is in fact a complex tapestry, a brocaded surface of intricate pattern. The moss is many different mosses of widely divergent forms. There are fronds like miniature ferns, wefts like ostrich plumes, and shining tufts like the silky hair of a baby. A close encounter with a mossy log always makes me think of entering a fantasy fabric shop. Its windows overflow with rich textures and colors that invite you closer to inspect the bolts of cloth arrayed before you. You can run your fingertips over a silky drape of plagiothecium and finger the glossy brotherella brocade. There are dark woolly tufts of decranum, sheets of golden brachythesium, and shining ribbons of minium. We're going to go with that minium. The yardage of nubbly brown calicladium tweed is shot through with gilt threads of campylium to press hurriedly by without looking is like walking by the Mona Lisa chatting on a cell phone oblivious I invite you to join me now in a moment of meditation or prayer. Loving God, Spirit of Life, we gather together this morning to give thanks for this day, for the chance to be together, and especially in gratitude for all those who mothered us into being. Our mothers are the first to show us what it means to love and to let ourselves be loved, truly the foundation of all of life. May we rejoice in this gift of love we have been given. Spirit of life, we know that Mother's Day is especially hard for some. Some of us are grieving our mothers, both newly passed and some gone a long time to some other place. We grieve with those longing to become mothers and with mothers who have lost children, especially at the hands of racial violence. Our hearts break with theirs and our hands work for change. We honor those whose relationships with their mothers are difficult or strained, knowing that this day is complicated. We celebrate adoptive mothers and all those whose path to motherhood has looked different than they may have thought. We rejoice in the gift of our other mothers, grandmothers, aunts, cousins, friends, all those who have helped to mother us a reminder that the work of loving is all of ours to do. Spirit of life, be with us today as we remember that there is no one way to be a mother, and the variety and complexity of experience is what makes life beautiful. Amen.
We've reached that point in our service this morning when we will uh, receive our, our offertory for our congregation. If you would like to give to our congregation financially, there will be instructions for how to do so on your screen. And if you would like to give to our congregation another way, uh, definitely find us on social media, give us a like, give us a follow, go on Facebook and give us a five-star review. That is also a great way to help us out. The offertory for the care and sustenance of this congregation and its work will now be graciously given and received. We're starting a new theme this week. Uh, the theme really began last week when, when our youth group gave their, their truly spectacular worship service. Um, you know, it is, it's funny, we had Youth Sunday planned for, for a different date, but we had to move it, and so the date that they were on last week is just sort of where it landed. Um, and I said, you know, I was supposed to be preaching about snails that day. Do you, do you think the youth group would want to do a, a service about snails? Like, you know, maybe we can see if they're interested. And what they put together is, is, is truly amazing. If you haven't seen that service, uh, I can't recommend it enough. So the theme this month is, is all things wise and wonderful. And uh, we're going to be talking about creatures and, and organisms that we often overlook. Uh, I first uh, thought of this series uh, when I learned the term charismatic megafauna. If we were uh, in the sanctuary full of people right now, I would say, everybody say charismatic megafauna. Uh, say that in your living rooms or wherever you're watching this. Hey, Chris, say charismatic megafauna. Charismatic megafauna. Right. Charismatic megafauna is an environmentalist term and it refers to animals that are instantly recognizable and, and that people are interested in, in preserving, right? And, and therefore, they make really good mascots for, for conservation efforts, right? Charismatic, meaning people like it, and megafauna, meaning, you know, mega is big, fauna is animal. Um, so this is, you know, the Bengal tiger. Or, or, or the giant panda, or, or the humpback whale, right? Animals that, that you see sort of as, as, you know, right in front in the environmentalist conservation efforts. But using these animals, uh, I, I understand, is, is controversial, right? Um, you know, the people who, who do it say, you know, anything that gets people excited about taking better care of our planet can't possibly be bad. But there are other voices in the environmentalist movement that say, you know, most endangered species aren't as charismatic, right? They, they don't make good stuffed animals, but they are no less important to the preservation of ecosystems. And so if we only focus on the animals that people like, then we lose sight of what we're trying to work towards. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not in any way qualified to be part of that 
conversation. Um, but I think it's interesting, and I think there's a spiritual component to this argument as well, right? When we think about our connections to the earth, when we think about our, uh, our, our spiritual home in the earth, and we think about our connections to animals as part of our, our, our creation, uh, and, and what animals do we value, right? Like when you have a picture of Noah's Ark for, for the kids, you know, what's Noah loading onto the ark? He's, he's got tigers, he's got pandas, he's got giraffes, he's got, you know, things that, that, that we like to look at. We don't really show Noah rescuing a pair of snails. Uh, but surely, snails are not any less important, right? They're not any less worth saving than any other species. And snails, as our youth taught us last week, have just as much to teach us as anything else on our planet and so that's what we're going to be looking at this month. We're going to be spending our time with four organisms that we might otherwise be tempted to overlook. And we're going to try to see what lessons they can teach us about our lives as spiritual people. And we're going to be uh, framing this very roughly uh, from the creation narrative in the book of Genesis. Right, uh, with the understanding, you know, we're, we're going to be skipping the parts of the Genesis creation narrative that are all about creating the sky and stars and planets because we did that series like a month ago and you all deserve a break. So in the creation narrative at the beginning of the book of Genesis, the first physical part of the world that God creates is, is dry land that is separate from the water. Interestingly, the book describes water as already having been there before the world is created, which is, it's interesting, but th that is an exegetical nut that we are going to crack another time. So the story says that before anything else, God creates dry land, and then on the same day, on the dry land, God creates the plants, right? So, so on, on the, that, that day, we just have have plants, and the book doesn't say which plants come first. But scientifically speaking, the first plants on our planet were mosses. There has been moss on our planet for 470 million years, making moss one of the most successful organisms that we know of. And a big part of moss's success comes from the fact that it is very simply constructed Right? And it, it requires relatively little nutrients and resources to thrive. And, and thus it can survive in many different environments. Moss, in some ways, is the baseline for all living things. It set the tone from which all of the rest of the reality that we know has sprung. And what's interesting is that Moss is also a reality in and of itself. Within patches of moss, there are entire ecosystems. There are species, there are water cycles whose entire microscopic existence happens within a, a, a patch of moss. When, and when we examine moss under a magnifying glass, it shows itself to be intricate and beautiful with leaves and shoots and branches finely woven together with creatures and water and other plants moving through them and living inside of them. Moss is a vessel for the magnificent contained within the seemingly mundane. And so this lesson that Moss teaches us is similar to a lesson that I learned in a receiving line in the summer of 2014. I had just preached my first sermon at the congregation where I did my internship, First Church in Boston. And I was feeling pretty good about it. You know, I mean, I hadn't passed out from nervousness and the congregation had laughed when I, I wanted them to laugh and nodded when I wanted them to nod. Um, and I was standing there in the receiving line and shaking everybody's hands in the, the, the way you could do before COVID. 
And then this guy came through the line, and this guy, his name was Leo. And Leo had been the congregation's music director for many decades before he retired many decades ago. And so Leo shook my hand and smiled, and he introduced himself, and then he said, one or two jokes is fine, but you're making too many. You're telling jokes in your sermons because you want us to like you, and that's an understandable thing to want, but it's drawing attention away from your message, and you don't need it. Your message is enough. And then he walked away. And, and this is what Leo did. Every time I, I preached, he would come through the receiving line, and he would just give me feedback that was, it was insightful, and, and it was well thought out, and it was phrased in a way that was always really kind, but really direct. Um, and it was something that, that I came to value. Just as a side note, this is not an invitation for, for all of you to start doing that in the receiving line when we someday get to start doing the receiving line again. Like, I, I am still more than happy to just smile and, and shake your hand. But, but I did come to really value these moments w with Leo, and it was something that I thought I, I was going to miss when I moved to Memphis. Uh, but when I moved here, I met Bob Deininger, who was a, a longtime beloved member of our congregation. And Bob would, would, would do something similar uh, in the receiving line. Bob was much gentler uh, with his feedback than, than Leo ever was. But I've been thinking about Bob and Leo recently and about this first lesson that Leo taught me about, about prioritizing spiritual truths over making people like me. And, you know, for the past year plus, I've had to preach without any of that, without making anybody laugh, right? I've had to enter a worship space in a way that cannot rely on my, my razzle-dazzle. Um, and that's new for me, right? I think as Americans, we are taught to want things that are big and flashy and exciting, right, in all parts of our lives, including our, our religious lives. And this is why so many mega churches have these, you know, big light displays and, and rock bands and, and LCD screens, right? We just have this idea that, that more is always better. And, you know, before this pandemic started, I was inching dangerously close to that mindset, right? I was focusing a lot of my energy on trying to make the worship services at the Church of the River bigger in every way. I was planning to add a second service on Sunday mornings. I wanted to hire a live band for the second service. Um, I was definitely focused on making sure that the pews were full in both the first and second service. And I wanted to take some time to work it all out in some kind of, you know, very glamorous spiritual planning retreat that would, that would look really good on Instagram in a way that would really help the church's brand. Um, and, you know, then, then this pandemic happened, and all of that had to be set aside, right? I haven't completely lost interest in any of those things. But the pilgrimage that I have found myself on this year has been more of an internal pilgrimage. It's been a search for religious insight that happens in the rhythms of day-to-day -day life. And so often, that is where God can be met, that is where the sacred can be experienced every once in a great while. We may get a spiritual moment that comes with some fireworks, right? A moment of revelation or the birth of a child or something really intense. But mostly, our connections with what exists beyond us come through building relationships with what is around us in our everyday lives. And in that way, the spiritual path that this pandemic has set us on is just like examining the worlds within a patch of moss. 
It's about realizing that every bit of the world we see around us has the divine woven into it. If only we are willing to look hard enough. And what's, what's funny to me about this is, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is itself a big, bright, intrusive event, right? It has violently and suddenly invaded our lives and caused all of us real trauma. I have dealt with more loss and heartbreak this year in my own life and in the life of the congregation than in the rest of my career put together. But I am convinced that the way to live through this big, loud event is to embody the opposite. It is to excuse ourselves from the need for the big, exciting, and flashy, and to let ourselves find God or find whatever we experience as divine in the patches of moss that we see around us, in the tiny little miracles and wonders of our everyday lives. And that's something that I hope we can at least partially take with us when this pandemic finally ends. You know, I, I like to say there is nothing good about this pandemic, but there can be good in the ways that we respond to it. And so what we have in front of us here is an opportunity to become less dependent on what is big and loud and new and more focused on finding love and truth in the lives that we have. And that, I think, is the advice that Leo was trying to give me when he told me that I didn't need to rely on my jokes in my preaching. He wasn't telling me that I'm not funny. I happen to know that I am hilarious. He was telling me that religious experiences don't need to be flashy and fresh. In fact, they usually aren't. God is not only present in our encounters with the charismatic megafauna of our spiritual world. God is present in our everyday lives, in our connections, and in what we see and whom we connect with, God is present in the mysteries and wonders that a person sees when you look close enough at something as every day as a patch of moss. I, I, I want to tell you all this little story as an example to, to close with. This past week, my son Gideon turned six months old. Uh, and so that means that, you know, the pediatrician says he can now eat solid food. So this past week he got to eat real food for the first time and we started him out with with eggs because ever since Sandra got pregnant she had this untamable craving for eggs. So we thought well there's probably something in there that 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 he wants. So we, you know, cooked him up these eggs kind of it, it's sort of a picture an empty omelet, right? Just kind of like a flat thin thing that you cut into strips. Um, and so we sat there in our dining room watching Gideon squealing with delight in his high chair and covering himself in, in eggs. He can get them to his face. It, it, it's in the mouth where, where, where he's not quite there. I think he managed to eat a few. So I was watching him, and as I was watching him, and Sanj and I were laughing at this, you know, this ridiculous scene, you know, Gideon going to town on the eggs, and the dog is running around at his feet, and eating everything that he drops, which is most of it. And as I was watching this and I thought about, you know, the time before the pandemic when I took so much pride in how, how busy I was. Now I was out in the world doing big, important things. I was preaching big services. I was going to fancy galas. I was flying around the country to teach and to speak. And here I was now sitting at the table and watching this hilariously gruesome display happening in front of me. And I think before the pandemic, I might have missed it. I mean, you know, I, I might have been physically present, but I don't know that I would have been paying attention in a way that let me feel the presence of God in that moment. 
I mean, there's nothing particularly special about a person eating eggs, even if they're eating them for the first time. In a certain sense, there's nothing really special about a person being born, right? Hundreds of thousands of people do it every single day. And still, I can tell you that I felt the presence of God in that moment just like I felt the presence of God in the moment that Gideon was born. It was a presence that didn't explode in my face, but that worked its way into my life and settled under the surface of who I am. When I think about Leo, Leo from First Church Boston, and Bob Dininger from Church of the River, both of them now of blessed memory. You know, and I try not to imagine the two of them looking down on me and critiquing my sermons together uh, because they were both humanists and I don't think that that's what they would want. But I think about these two men, both of whom I met when I was in my 20s and they were in their 90s. And I do like to think that I have integrated who they were and who they still are to me into who I am like part of the ecosystem in a patch of moss that is my life and my outlook. The lessons that they taught me are now a part of my everyday life, and I have learned to see the sacred in the moment that I had with them, just like the moment when my son ate his first eggs or in the moments when I get to examine a patch of moss, and this is why the book of Genesis begins with God creating moss. It begins with God creating countless tiny worlds within worlds, with the spirit of all that is good and sacred being enclosed in all of the tiny overlooked parts of our world and of our lives. Amen. Go, encounter the world at its ugliest until you find beauty. Go, encounter the world at its cruelest until you find compassion. Go, encounter yourself at your worst until you find that you are a beloved child of God. Go in peace and amen.
talk with.